What can I get you? You order. Two tequila old fashions with a splash of cerveza and a chili garnish. Duo of Johnny Silverhands coming up. Right on, chica. Somebody did their homework. Looks like the dog ate mine. Welcome to Outside Xbox and to the latest gameplay from Cyberpunk 2077, a game more hotly anticipated than the next Game of Thrones book and with 100% more Keanu Reeves. I mean, unless George R.R. R. Martin inserts a pretty wild plot twist. If you feel like you've seen plenty of Cyberpunk 2077 and you know everything there is to know about the game already, we've got some good news. Having played four hours of it this very week, we're pleased to report Cyberpunk 2077 still has the capacity to surprise. Here are seven Cyberpunk revelations we weren't expecting. Plan simple. Do nothing odd. Don't get creative. You go in, snatch the cash, get out. And we sell the BD to those psycho freaks from the studio. Got it, got it. And remember, Everything on full blast. They'll spot us extra for a wicked adrenaline high. The most important new element of Cyberpunk 2077 revealed in the latest gameplay is something called a brain dance. The idea is that you're reliving memories and emotions recorded by other people's cybernetic implants. That was too much. I felt I could feel the guy's pain, his dress, his hope. Hope wrapped up in something else. Some of the applications are sleazy, this is a dystopia after all, but there are also more wholesome experiences, like, say, getting shot in the back of the head during a botched convenience store holdup. I mean, whatever floats your boat. Ah! Where things get really interesting for you, the player, is when you switch to brain dance editing mode. At this point, you can fly around the scene and analyze things that even the person recording the brain dance might not have noticed at the time, like this security screen on the counter at the store. His own chumba shot him. Probably planned to all along. Must have got a nice slice of cred on the black market for a BD like this. With the ability to analyze sounds and also thermal signatures from recorded brain dances, this is more than just a side activity. Sometimes you can analyze extra layers in the raw, stuff the rollers cyberware picked up. Like what? Ev's got Kiroshi optics that grab infrared, meaning you should be able to grab heat signatures from her recording. You'll use brain dance editing early in the game's main story to case a hotel penthouse before you attempt an ambitious heist there, and we anticipate it being something that comes in useful several times over the course of the plot. Pack of six, case of brosif, and a couple of zappers. And before you ask, no, brain dance is not named after what happens to the contents of this guy's skull after getting shot. Gross. See that? They shot him and he never saw it coming. But you will. Here it comes, my favorite part of the game. Your moment to shine, kiddo. Good luck. Let's take this piece of wonder tech for a whirl. You're a man of little faith. See? We're rich. Now fire her up and call me when you're underway. Tell you where to go. Hmm. Looks like this will be a cool breeze. It must be difficult to create the beginning of a game. It's got to grab the player immediately, it's got to show the game in its best light, and it's also likely to be the bit people remember the best and replay the most. Particularly if they, like us, have to quit partway through and start again because they spent all their experience points on being a smartass. Did anyone ask your opinion? So we can't imagine how tough it is to craft three entirely separate prologues, which is exactly what Cyberpunk 2077 developer CD Projekt Red has done, like that one kid in school who used to ask for extra homework. Before the game kicks off, you have to choose what CD Projekt Red calls a life path. It's basically an origin story, and you can select from Street Kid, Corpo, or Nomad. Can always look for another shop where they won't ask a lone nomad why he's hugging the border. Street kids are urban streetwise types who have lived their entire lives in Night City. Nomads are wanderers who are drawn from out in the Badlands to try and make their fortune in the heaving metropolis. Corpos, meanwhile, are from the wealthy corporate elite and are probably jerks, but definitely look the most familiar with the concept of daily showers. Stout, take it you were the one to call? Yep. Wanted. 
We had assumed this choice would just mean a few different dialogue options here or there, or maybe a slightly different starting location, but having played the early hours of the game we now know that each prologue is entirely different, with its own questline, characters and objectives that drive you towards the story proper. Either way, the ending's the same. I'm taking the car. What? What are you doing? Can you got us? If you're a street kid, you'll start in a bar in the local neighbourhood of Haywood, trying to steal a valuable luxury car from an underground parking garage, which is a far cry from what you'll be up to in the sleek world of the Corpos. It's nomads that have the most dramatically different introduction to the game though, in that they don't even start inside the city itself. And speaking of being outside the city, take a look at this. Okay, let's see what happens. It's like I was telling you. No. Not shabby at all. The question's how long it'll last you. It'll get me to Night City. I figure something else out there. Everything we've previously seen from Cyberpunk 2077 has been inside the limits of Night City, where the game is set. And to be fair, when Night City looks this good, you can see why. What came as one of the most left-field surprises when playing Cyberpunk 2077, though, was that if you choose to play as a nomad, you don't actually start the game in Night City. What's more, you get to see that in the neon-drenched cyberpunk future, not everywhere is as neon-drenched and cyberpunk as the footage we've been shown so far. As you can see in this new footage, as a nomad, you actually have to make your way to Night City in the first place, in a beat-up old car that is way less cool than the sleek cybermobiles shown to date. I bet Keanu Reeves doesn't have to drive one of these. Cyberpunk. Although it's not quite post-apocalyptic out here in the sticks, since there are hotels and gas stations and the like, there is still a Mad Max quality to the landscape, with the desert and the burned out cars and the rusted, dilapidated signage. Worst of all, you have to deal with a small town sheriff who, as tropes demand, is a cast iron future jerk with a camera in his hat. Don't you know you owe the sheriff a word when you pay his town a visit? To tell him what's brought you here. Maybe even over a cup of coffee. No need to worry, I won't be staying long. I can see why most of the game is set in Night City. You're for a fight. Which one of you's my guy? Me. I wasn't expecting the tag team. But whatever, I guess. So, who do I got first? In the technologically advanced dystopian future of cyberpunk lore, humanity may not have evolved beyond the need for violent conflict, <laughs> but we imagined it had evolved beyond the need for doing violent conflict with anything so basic as punching. This is pointless. I know where I'm gonna strike before I do it. Typical. Knew I'd say that. Yet here we are in Cyberpunk 2077, where cyber protagonist V rocks up for a friendly street brawl with two guys who turn out to be one guy. I used to be twins, which you could probably guess. Twins had a close bond. They wanted to be closer, stronger. So they installed neural oscillation sinks, and now they're, well, me. One, one person, person two, bodies. two bodies. Somehow, in the world of cyberpunk, this one dude with two synchronized bodies is less surprising than a fight where your enemy uses nothing but fists and feet, instead of carbon fiber arm blades and go go gadget spring legs. <laughs> But it's also an insight into the melee combat of Cyberpunk 2077, which is surprisingly deep for a game where we expect to be doing more shooting and hacking than fisticuffs, complete with a parry system and stamina that needs to be managed. In fact, if you sink lots of points into the body attribute of your character, you could potentially build a fighter who favours clattering enemies up close and personal over gunplay. That's what these twins should have done, instead of spending all their eddies on having their brains cybernetically smushed together. <laughs> now you've got two rubbish bodies instead of one seven foot robot body. Big mistake.
Human bodies with cybernetic implants are even more central to the cyberpunk genre than flying cars, neon signs, and shady backstreet ripper docks. That's Karoshi. Best I've got. And she'd be about right under the circumstances. Now, I for one can't wait to have my human fingers surgically replaced with USB sticks, but it turns out that not everyone in this brave new world is up for getting high-tech prostheses. I can't understand why, especially not when you can use your cyborg super brain to hack enemy gang members and make them go on fire. It's just a matter of time, mother Obviously though, cybernetic augmentation should be a matter of personal choice. But this being a gritty dystopia, there's always gotta be somebody taking things too far, like the jerk gang members in this mission, who have kidnapped a Buddhist monk and plan to give him implants against his will. You know, for the lols. You are initially given this mission by the kidnapped monk's pacifist brother, who pleads with you to rescue said monk and do it without bloodshed. Friend, I can do one of those two things. It is a surprise to find an entirely unaugmented, all-natural human being here in the post-human future, but it takes all sorts to make a world. Do not do this! Implantation is against my beliefs. Please! I do not want them. Hey buddy, don't worry. As long as you're sure you don't want to set people on fire with your brain. No? Okay. You gonna tell me what happened back there? <laughs> Let's say I have a bad feeling about this. Oh. Happened a lot to you? Rarely. When we started playing Cyberpunk, we weren't 100% sure whether actually getting around Night City would be much fun. After all, CD Projekt Red has never made a game with cars in it before. Unless they snuck one into Gwent? No, I'm pretty sure that was all cards. Fortunately, driving around the city streets in your Quadra Turbo R is great. Your car is agile and darty, less like the somewhat realistic rides in GTA V, and much more like the Batmobile in Arkham Knight, but without the awful tank sections. You are also going to have to get used to firing from a moving vehicle. Combat during car chases is a more significant part of the game than we were expecting. In these scenarios, you can fire your pistol from the driver's seat or anything else in your arsenal if you can convince your mate Jackie to do the driving. Whereas every bullet impact in regular combat is a carefully calculated balance of your stats and those of your weapon, you'll be pleased to hear that your car itself can also be used as an extremely effective offensive weapon. In fact, when we were playing for ourselves, we hacked a barrier specifically to raise it so we could drive our car in and run over some baddies. Just try not to damage the paintwork too much. That car is a future classic, like really far in the future. Gotta keep moving! The place used to be a morgue. You believe that? Who would have thunk? I know, right? Way before our time, that. When proper burials were still a thing. You might remember a guy called Royce from a previous Cyberpunk 2077 gameplay demo. Big guy, anger management problems, distinct lack of forehead. Two questions. What the is going on? And who the is this? That's the one. That earlier gameplay demo showed a full-on gunfight with Royce, but the developer commentary teased the different possibilities, depending on what decisions you made in the run-up to the mission. That wasn't the smoothest raid, but we've got the bot and Dex should be happy. But think back. What would have happened if we hadn't met with the Militech agent? Or told Royce about the agent and her plans? Or just decided to buy the bot ourselves? So many options, so many possibilities. 
and each will have consequences that will ripple through the game world and your story. What was not revealed is that there is yet another option. It's not illustrated in this footage here, but when we played the game we found you can literally just walk past the boss, as long as you can walk in a sort of crouch and resist the urge to stick your head up from behind a crate. If you look as you enter the room, in the far right there is an illuminated exit sign. That is literally the exit to the building, clearly marked in case of emergencies. Pretty considerate for a murderous gang of techno thugs. If you've got half-decent stealth skills, you can sneak along the right side of the room and slip out of the fire exit. Royce will be none the wiser, and you will completely avoid a boss fight that is potentially very challenging, particularly if you put all of your attribute points into being a smartass, like we always do. There is obviously a penalty to being a stealthy coward and dodging the boss. You'll miss out on a unique piece of loot, in this case a legendary pistol. But you know what's an even bigger penalty? Me, getting shot to bits by Royce. I'll see you in the parking lot. About goddamn time. Let's get out of here. There you have it, seven things that surprised us the most when we finally got our hands on Cyberpunk 2077. Do you have any lingering questions about CD Projekt Red's dystopian sci-fi epic? Let us know in the comments, and then like and subscribe right now and we will do our best to answer them in a future video. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time. Welcome to Lizzie's.